got to prove it all night. I mean, you've got you've got to prove it. You've got to show people. Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook, presented by Details Interactive. Here, you'll take away three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number two, and today's guest is Mitch Slater. Mitch is a financial advisor with UBS, and he also hosts his own podcast titled Financially Speaking. Let's open the playbook. Ready? Break. Well, here we go. I'm joined in the plush studios of the Marketing Playbook podcast with one of my very good friends, Mitch Slater. Welcome, Mitch. Great to be here, Mark. Well, thanks for uh, for joining me. Uh, you and I have uh, been friends for over 30 years. I remember uh, the first day you came over to my house with your dog, and the, the dog pranced into the living room. And in those <laughs> days, we were not dog people. That's but, for uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> now we are. But um, I'm really glad that you could be part of uh, one of the first episodes that I'm doing. Honored to be here. So let's jump right into some funny things before mm-hmm. we kind of set the stage. Sure. Uh, you have a funny story we both participated in about a baseball game. <laughs> Would you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Well, I have a lot of funny stories, Mark. And this this is not, in my opinion, everyone else thinks it's a funny story. It still bothers me. Uh, so Mark and I are both Met fans. And we were at a Met-Yankee game. And this is one of the first time that they were having interleague. And it was one of the, actually one of the best games. It was a close game. It was a hot day, very hot day. I think it was like July. The great play where El Duque threw his mitt <laughs> to, to Paul O'Neill, who caught it. And it was about the fifth inning of the game. And I, I had to get some water. I was, I was just parched. So I go up get to, this is the old Yankee Stadium, folks. So if you remember anyone who's ever been there, there's not a lot of room from the entrance there. And there's this huge line of people trying to get mostly beer. And next to it are cases and cases of Poland spring water. And I'm dying. So I take a $20 bill out of my wallet. I walk up, I grab one of those bottles of water. I'm walking up to the counter to give the woman, here, take $20, keep the, keep the change. Someone comes up behind me, literally lifts me up, security, you're out of Yankee Stadium. And he literally threw me out of Yankee Stadium. And these are the early days of cell phones, but I'm glad I had one. And I called you and another friend and I said, guys, I just got thrown out of Yankee Stadium for stealing water. And we wound up having to go to the front office and Kenny Rogers had sang the national anthem. And my friend uh, who was there as well, he's talking to Kenny Rogers, he could care less. And that was it. I left and I, it was... It and it was, was the first inning or the second inning, if I remember. It was early in we, the game. And, and we lost. Yeah. And I think had this been the, the era of Uber, right. you wouldn't have been so nice <laughs> and driven home with me. That's for sure. So anyway, that's a good way of, of yeah. starting. Uh, give me some perspective on your background, you know, where you grew up. I know you live in Westfield, New Jersey mm-hmm. now. Where did you grow up and how did your, you know, your early life kind of uh, foreshadow where you'd wind up today? Sure. Well, I grew up not far from here in Springfield, New Jersey. And I, growing up, I was always very into theater, very into entertainment, very into music. These were things that just kind of were very important to me. And I was fortunate to have some relatives that knew a lot about those fields and wanted to go to a college that had something to do with theater. I'd studied actually at Northwestern University for a summer. Uh, my math SAT scores, which I think to this day are still one of the, the all-time lows in New Jersey, kept me out of there. And I went to school in D.C. at GW, where I started studying theater, but I really found radio and TV and wound up majoring. And the best part of those years really were the internships. So I interned for everyone from Howard Stern, his first job at DC 101, to Charlie Rose, a name we usually don't say anymore, and Larry King, um, who I met through Charlie Rose, hired me right out of college. And it was just a great experience in those early days. The communication skills that I learned from theater to bring them into radio and TV really helped me move as after six or seven years in that field, I realized that this was not going very well. I was having a lot of fun. I was living in LA and New York and Philadelphia. And I met a girl in Philadelphia and she got a job in New York and I had to find a job. And my dad was with Merrill Lynch and somehow convinced me 
that being a financial advisor would be a great choice. I thought he was nuts. I never read the Wall Street Journal. I, like I said, the math scores weren't great, but he had a manager who could sell. And he told me that you're going to you know, make this money. You have communication skills. 90% of this is communication skills. Kid will teach you the rest. And kind of 32 years later, uh, he was right. That's that's mm-hmm. great. And you know, although the the podcast is called the Marketing Playbook, and we want to talk a lot about marketing and 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 how people can bring things back to their business to help them improve their business. One of the things I also want to do is be able to help mentor younger people. Networking is a really important thing. I think I'm a pretty good networker. I've gotten um, you know the relative success that I think I've enjoyed in my career. Most of it has come through networking. Talk a little bit about networking and how that's played a role in 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 your uh, career. Networking is everything. It's all about connections, and it's the connections that you make. I mean, you know, we grew up in a generation before LinkedIn uh, where it wasn't so easy to connect with all of these people. So you had to go out, you know, and you had to you had to really go out there and and shake hands and meet people, and you can't have any fear. And if you're going to be a good networker, you have to just you know leave your ego at the door, leave fear out of it, and just go be curious about everything. And when I worked for Larry King, I think I I learned that one of the greatest tools of all time was to be a good listener, which is why you have two ears and 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 uh, you know, uh, one mouth. One mouth. Exactly. I was going to say two eyes. <laughs> I always forget what that saying is. But by being curious, I would ask people, what do you do? And what do you do? And what do you do? And then I actually started when I was at Merrill Lynch, I started my own networking club and actually franchised it to other Merrill Lynch's offices around the country and trained people how to network. And that led to the success because I knew I was not going to pick up the phone and cold call people. That was not who I am. I like to get out there and shake hands and meet people. So networking is everything in life. Totally agree. That, that's good, uh, good advice. Um, one of the things I have always uh, found interesting about you is that you have so many interests. Uh, and, and even though we've been friends for all these years, it seems like each time you do a podcast or we spend time together, I learn something new about you. But if you took all the things that you've done, what is your most significant passion? Well, I think my passion is really enthusiasm. I think at the end of the day, enthusiasm really is everything. And the last four letters of the word enthusiasm are I-A-S-M, which means I am sold myself. So if you're going to be passionate about something, you have to believe in it. You have to feel that whoever you're talking to needs to believe in it. So for me, being enthusiastic was truly the passion. Obviously, my biggest passion outside of my kids is, is the world of Bruce Springsteen, and, and anyone that knows me knows that that's been a passion for 40 years, 300 shows, and now know a lot of the members of the band. So I've been really lucky that I've actually been able to uh, take that passion of music, where I played piano for many years uh, and had this artist that I just respected to actually now know the man. It's funny. I've known you all these years, and I didn't know you were passionate about this guy named Springsteen. Yeah, uh, yeah, you would never know it. <laughs> Let's move to uh, a thread uh, in a lot of the things that you've done, and and I think that thread is around kids. Um, if you look at some of the things that you've done, uh, you participated in the Westfield, New Jersey School Board, where we work together. Uh, you've done a, ra- a bunch of things around music for kids, financials for kids. You coached uh, baseball. So so talk about kids, the role that they've played in your life and, and what you've tried to do to help them. Well, I think it all comes down to that I like kids better than I like adults, just like I like dogs better than I like most humans. Kids are incredible and kids love to learn. And I feel very fortunate in my life uh, to have been able to accomplish so many things and be able to give back and have a good education, which is unexpected that I got involved with Board of Education, which was probably also unexpected for you, since I'm the guy that suggested it to you. But the more that I learned about how you can really help kids, especially those that aren't as fortunate to live in a town like we live in, uh, that kids, so many things have been cut out in the education system. And people talk about STEM and science and technology and engineering and mathematics, but you really need, it should be STEAM you got to have the arts in there. And I love tying my passion about the arts with kids. So I've been involved with organizations like Little Kids Rock, 
which brings musical instruments back into the classroom and teaches teach kids how to play songs that they want to play, not the typical music industry of before music school or classes, band class. And, you know, they, they force you to play Bach or Beethoven, but these kids want to play Wiz Khalifa or Taylor Swift or Bruce Springsteen. So teach them that right away. And through that and through my passion in the Springsteen world and meeting Steve Van Zant, I got involved with another organization called Teach Rock, where there's actually a curriculum about the history of rock, but ties it into what's happening through different generations. So if you're going to talk about the civil rights movement in the 60s, you're going to talk about what happened on February 2nd, 1964, when the Beatles showed up on Ed Sullivan. So you tie it all together. And then when it comes to finance, I mean, this is this is just one of the major problems in our in our society is that they don't teach you the basics in school about financial education. And this is something that's gone on for years. A good friend of mine, Neil Godfrey, who's written a number of books on this topic, she talks about growing up in a generation uh, where the moms are wearing pearls and the dads would come home at five o'clock, put on their slippers and and they'd sit down for dinner. But also in that generation, it was actually easier to talk about sex than it was money. Money was taboo. And ironically, that hasn't changed that much. I, I meet with a lot of people through 401k plans that I manage that are millennials, and they also have no clue. So it's got to be taught. And I was fortunate with Neil to be part of a group of people that got financial education or financial literacy mandated in every school in New Jersey. And that's a that, to me, is something that has to continue and and ironically, what it's led to is this crisis uh, that we have in the student loan industry where it's, you know, $1.6 trillion in student debt. I mean, the economy could literally be brought down by what's happening in the student loan situation. And, you know, maybe if somebody had some financial education as a kid, they might have learned something. All right. That's great. And so uh, going back to the school board, you joined the school board. Um, a few years before uh, you wrote me into it. What was your reason for participating there? And what do you think your, your takeaway, you know, after the six plus years that you served, what was your main takeaway? Well, I joined the school board initially because of something that I felt that was unfair that was happening that had to do with uh, moving kids from one school to another. And honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I literally walked in there day one, thought I could change the world. And uh, it took me a while to figure out how that whole system worked. But once I got involved, I realized how far behind our particular school district was in the world of technology. And that these kids were not using the technology of today. They were they were sharing a cart, you know, with one computer. The, the the infrastructure wasn't in place. Money had been spent in other areas that I'm sure were very important, but we need we were behind. So one of the things I'm the proud thing I'm most proud of during my tenure in the school board was developing a technology strategy along with someone like you who worked in the industry and some smart people that were already uh, working for the school. And now, you know, a lot of money's been spent and, and we're, we're a school system that people, other schools around the state look to. But to answer the last part of the question, I think what I learned more than anything is the old, there's no I in team. And I got on that school board day one and I thought, you know, yes, I can check my ego at the door, but I really couldn't because I was so frustrated what this one member would say or, or, or I would disagree. And, and it took me a while to realize, you know what, we can collaborate. We may not be seeing this right now in the United States in Washington, but at least the nine of us could actually agree and figure out we were all there for the same purpose to, for the kids and to bring the best education and also use taxpayer money in the most fiscally responsible way. So I learned a lot from every single member of the board. I learned a lot from, uh, from, from your experience. I learned a lot from some of the lawyers on the board, and I learned some from the educators on the board. I'm so proud that I had that experience. Not something I ever expected in my life, but I think everybody needs to do some form of public service. So I feel good that I did have that six years. And I know you're going to say it wasn't quite six years, but I almost made it. 
Well, I was not going to say that, but I, I was going to thank you for uh, for asking me to uh, to run. I'm glad that I did. Um, I got a, a lot of the same satisfaction out of doing that as as you did. Um, some similar from a technology perspective. I, I think I was able to participate, you know, from a financial perspective with my background there, and also, you know, from a marketing point of view. You know, people think of a board of ed, you don't think a lot about marketing. You don't think about, you know, necessarily communication. You think about curriculum and you think about legislation and teachers and, mm-hmm. and overhead and expense. Um, but there was an opportunity. Well, there was to a market. huge, there was a huge gap. I mean, I, I got my first board of ed meeting. I said, where's our Facebook page? They, they looked at me like I had four heads, but within a couple of years, we developed a Facebook page because we wanted to be about transparency, and it was very positive, and we had a superintendent getting messages out because that's what was happening in our neighborhood, in our, in our little town of 30,000 people. That was a place that everybody was going. So you've got to be there. You can't just walk away from it and pretend it doesn't exist. So marketing is extremely important. Um, as, as a form of communication in, in education like anything else. Yeah, and I think that's the point is that marketing is important regardless of, of what you're doing. So if you think about that, and we talked about it in education, your career has been in financial services. Um, you have your own podcast show, Financially Speaking. Uh, that's the right title, right? Yep. Financially Speaking. With Mitch Slater. Uh, with Mitch Slater, of yeah. course. There are, there are like nine other Financially Speakings. I should have copyrighted it. I had a radio show in the 90s with that name. Who knew I should have copyrighted it then? <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the consistency in all the things we do is that there's a requirement for you to market. Either you're marketing yourself, you're marketing products to consumers, uh, you're marketing to other you know, colleagues. There's all, it's all around marketing. So talk a little bit about how you have built your own brand over time and how you've marketed yourself to help build the career that you've been in. Well, I think I realized early on that my brand is me. It, that's just the bottom line when you're, when you're in sales, so to speak. So you have to build your brand. And the best way I could build my brand was to get people to trust me and likability and get people to like me. And the way you have to do that is, to quote Bruce Springsteen, you've got to prove it all night. I mean, you've got, you've got to prove it. You've got to show people. Uh, you have to really spend time with them and listen to them and and go to their functions and th- that they're involved in, get involved with some of their nonprofits that, that they care about and really show an interest, not that I just want to manage your money, but I actually want to learn more about you. So through my career, it was really about my brand was getting people to know me and to like me and to trust me. I'm not naive. Everyone you meet isn't going to like you. You know, chemistry isn't going to be right. But if they really get to know you as a human being and know the kind of person you are, the kind of husband you are, the kind of father you are, the kind of son you are, uh, then people can relate more and more to that. So the under over was 10 minutes where the first Springsteen reference would come out. Uh, so I think we got under the, the, oh. the 10 minutes from at the beginning. But so that's good. You know, the, the key here is that marketing is everywhere and, and you've been successful in building your brand over time with a lot of the varied interests you know, that you have. Uh, going back to the, the show that you do, the podcast that you do, I've listened to just about all of them. Uh, I think I may uh, get the award for having list, listened to the, the most of your uh, podcast. Well, I appreciate it. You're the one that's listening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's been, uh, I think they've been really interesting. But you've met a lot of interesting people. Uh, who are the, the few that have stood out for you and why? Well, that's been the highlight of doing the podcast for me, really. And, and that's really kind of the same thing when I had my radio show is I love meeting interesting people. And I'm really curious to learn about how people got to where they're at. So immediately, I think of these two women uh, who both were just born entrepreneurs. I mean, one at 13 years old, Rachel Tipograph, who runs a company called Micmac, which is kind of similar to Shopify. Brilliant, brilliant young woman. But at 13 years old, when when most of us, you know, got our bar, bat mitzvah presents, uh, you know, we hung on to them. Uh, she sold them immediately on eBay. And she started taking that money and selling other things and, and just starting to learn more and more about money. Uh, I think of Erin Lowry, who wrote a book called Broke Millennial. Erin had the choice. She's a very smart young woman. She had the choice to go to Dartmouth and she decided to go to St. Bonaventure. 
because she knew the difference that it was going to cost and what she wanted to do in her career wouldn't really matter and wound up not having to have six figures in, in student loan debt. And she's written books. Uh, I'll put a plug in for her book called Broke Millennial. And she teaches you know, kids our age the, the basics about everything from you know, buying, getting your first apartment, renting, uh, your credit score, all of these little things. Then I think about Kim Kalp. Kim Kalp um, was on Shark Tank and actually turned down the money. She and, and a friend of hers uh, had this idea for a business, you know, about they were fans of the, the, she would notice out there for the, we'll use the Mets, something that we, we share in common, that they're all which is one of her their clients, that the Mets would have all of these events. And how do they connect the fans? And that was her job to figure out a way to connect the fans with different events. And she started doing that for Comic-Con and doing all these things. And she went on Shark Tank and they loved her idea. And they were going to give, I think they were going to give her a couple of hundred thousand dollars. But at the end of the day, they wanted way too much ownership. And she felt that she and her partner could just do it on their own. And they wound up getting help from some of the sharks anyway, because they really respected them. And that's how they picked up some clients. And she's very active on Instagram and she's... You know, she's put in the 10,000 hours. And I think that's the common trait with a lot of the folks that I've met, you know, that are that are in wine businesses, that are running sports agencies, is that they're putting in the time and they're putting in the effort. And they know that you don't just wake up one morning and be successful. You have to work at it. And the other part, other area that I would mention that's been really fascinating is at UBS, we have a bunch of global visionaries. These are people from around the world that are doing amazing things that we like to highlight. And I've interviewed um, two so far that I would mention. One is actually speaking today at Davos. She is the leading person in the world of vertical farming, Sonia Lowe, brilliant, brilliant woman who was not in that world. She was she went to Stanford and she was in the world of private equity. And, and then she heard about vertical farming. She took a little interest in this little company in Boston, which she's now the CEO called Crop One Holdings or Fresh Box Farms. And she's basically growing greens. And then all of a sudden, Emirates Airlines finds out about what she's doing. They give her $50 million to build in the desert this entire plant. And, you know, it's obviously sustainability to the max. And then recently, I interviewed a gentleman from the UK, Andrew Bastuaros, who as a kid was called a lazy kid and and, and people would make fun of him. And it was basically because he needed glasses. And finally, when he got glasses and he talked about the first time looking up at the stars and seeing that there were actually leaves on and, and they had a color, he knew very at a very young age that he wanted to help people. And he became an ophthalmologist. He became an eye surgeon. And then he went to Kenya with his wife in his early 30s and noticed that half the planet can't see, and we can correct it very simply. So he worked with somebody, he found somebody who could help develop technology, who came to Kenya, was supposed to be there with him for two weeks, wound up staying six months, and they developed an app, they have a company called Peak Vision, where they go into these remote villages, show this app, this little thing, an eye test, and then they turn it around, and companies like Warby Parker get involved and send them glasses. And what a difference that makes. And they're changing the world. And, and I have such admiration for these people that are not only putting in the time, but they're really, really making a difference. Because the older we get, the more we care about legacy, obviously. And, and, and I'm just so impressed by people. Yeah, that's great. Where, where have you tended to find the people that you're inviting on as guests? From a, a variety of things. I mean, working for a global firm like UBS, um, they, they put out a lot of really interesting content. So I have, you know, kind of glommed on to where I, I hear about things. I also read a lot and I know what books are interesting. And I have now, I'm now at the point where publishers are sending me books and sending me ideas. But at the end of the day, I want to find guests that I think are going to be interesting or if I'm on the other end walking my dog right now and I'm, you know, listening to a podcast, trying to, you know, have some curiosity what that person is thinking. So somebody who's making a difference, somebody who's doing things uh, really special. And also maybe there's a couple of tips that that person can put out there that could, I don't know who's going to help 
31 countries, I'm told, Spotify are listening to my show. they probably all my crazy Springsteen fans that I know from all over the world. But maybe they pick up one or two things here or there from a book or from or from one of these people that, that could be life-changing. Well, you've set a good uh, foundation. I'm you know, using uh, a lot of what you've done, uh, hopefully taking it with a marketing spin uh, for what we're doing here. And uh, there's tons of interesting people out there and you know, people that are doing innovation, sustainability. You mentioned uh, mm-hmm. sustainability. It's incredible. Uh, the number of companies that I'm seeing, especially in the fashion world nowadays, um, things that you wouldn't expect, you know, taking plastic bottles and turning them into men's bathing suits right. um, and using and taking those bottles and turning them into uh, shoes and sneakers. Well, I, I, I had a guy on um, who actually went to Bali and uh, he for, uh, on, a, on a vacation and couldn't believe all the plastic bottles that were in the water. And he now has a business where he... He recycles all of these plastic bottles and he's done these trips and he makes these amazing backpacks and he's creating all of these other products um, that are through recyclables. And that generation, our kids' generation and even younger, it's extremely important. And, you know, people out there, the young women, young women like Greta, um, you know, who was the time person of the year, people are listening to and they respect that and they want to do what they can. So sustainability is not going anywhere. It's a big deal throughout business more and more. And I think people should educate themselves as much as they can because it's, it's not going away. The devil's in the details. You've probably heard that phrase time and time again in your professional life. Projects get started with great intentions, but you no longer have the time to pay attention to the little things that could be the difference between success and failure. At Details Interactive, you can discuss your business with a seasoned direct-to-consumer marketing executive who's helped launch and grow web businesses and integrate multi-channel marketing initiatives. Learn more at detailsinteractive.com. You mentioned while we were talking about the school board, your uh, belief in in social media and how you've used it. Uh, You know, there's I I think, you know, most people have adopted social media in some way, shape or form, though I have plenty of friends that are still not on on Facebook um, and some of them not on LinkedIn and certainly not on Instagram. But it's played a big role in what you have done. Uh, Talk a little bit about why it's interesting to you, number one. And also, I, I'm, even though you are uh, put words in your mouth, you are pro-social media, there's clearly some negatives. So kind of flip the, the pages yourself and, and talk about some of the negatives that are out there. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's a great question. I think that for me, when it comes to social media, I met the, the right guy at the right time. I was introduced to Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm sure everyone listening to this podcast knows Gary V and his story by now. And he's, you know, just incredible and runs now one of the largest social media marketing agency. But as I got to know Gary, not only as a client, but as a bit of a mentor, I really got a sense of what was happening out there. And I felt like I got ahead of the curve and I was willing to take risks. Some worked, some didn't. Um, but as you know, getting transparency, uh, as we talked about to the parents of our school district at the time was was so important, which is why, you know, we brought up the idea of doing Facebook there. I'm not, I think it's fair to say that personally, I'm not known for holding back. Um, I, I kind of lead a few different lives. Uh, in some ways, I'm Sybil. I guess you have to be over 50 to, to know that reference, but uh, without the disease. Um, but I have my Springsteen world. So I have social media where I'll walk into the pit during a concert and I'll interview people and I'll be showing video to fans in Barcelona and fans in Norway. And, and it it just has become incredible. You know, people know the stuff that I've done through that world when it comes to politics, which I certainly don't talk about on my podcast. The only thing I would say is that I speak my mind. Um, and I, kind of feel for for me, I've always felt that Facebook is my own kind of news network. I'm a news junkie. I guess if things had worked out for me, I would have, you know, been a newscaster or an anchor or something like that. So uh, I say what I want to say. And if people don't like it, they have, you know, just like you could change the channel, they have the right to block me and and God bless them. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But, you know, and then I'd like to share on the positive side, still things like, you know, my family and, and my dogs. But you know, people can really suck. And I I joke about it, but as I said earlier, but I really do prefer dogs to humans because the same bullies, the same hateful people, whether they're racist, whether they're anti-Semites, whether they're anti-whatever, 
they found a new home and that's social media. And that's the worst part. That's the negative part, as well as not knowing what's real and what's made up. You know, I think you have to find sources in life that you trust. For me, my wife works at Time Magazine. I trust what that publication does. I read the New York Times. You have to trust that, but there is a lot of negativity there and you have to be careful. And the the best advice that I can give from learning personally, firsthand folks, don't get involved in the middle of something. If, If there's a conversation on social media and you think you've got a clever point of view, keep it to yourself. Because I have learned firsthand, once you get involved, it's hard to pull yourself back out. You know, uh, the old Pacino line, you know, they, they, when I got out, they pulled me back in. Uh, so you, you have to be careful. And that exists everywhere. Doesn't, and, 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 and I'm not just talking about Facebook and Twitter and, and, and Instagram, but even LinkedIn. I, I'm starting to see people bring in controversy to LinkedIn, which is not where it belongs. So you got to be careful. Yeah. And, you know, and I found in, in my world where we've used uh, social media to help extend brands, uh, to actually sell product, it's certainly been, you know, very, very helpful. Um, and, you know, just like in any other channel that has developed, there's so much noise out there now. Um, you know, influencers continue to be a major part for the fashion industry. And there was some cynicism out there. You know, influencers started, you know, it was grassroots. People um, started to, you know, promote particular products. Then there was the cynicism where people started to think that these influencers were being paid. And in fact, they were by brands. And and now there's been some policing there. And there's been a lot more um, clarity about influencers coming out um, and and promoting things and and a little bit less cynicism, I think. I know you're the host, but I got to ask you a question because does it surprise you for someone who's, you know, had such an incredible career early on in the e-commerce world to working for some major brands to see the success of some of these influencers, I mean, I'm thinking of the Kardashian, uh, you know, billion dollar business. I mean, I, I just, for me, it's just so hard to, you know, kind of wrap my head around. Yeah, I think it's hard to believe because, you know, at the end of the day, what did they do? They they leveraged free social media for, right. uh, for most of what they were doing, but it just, it proves the power of social media and how many people were engaged with it. And, you know, some people take it for what it's worth. And some people didn't, but you know, look, we're a celebrity culture, you know, yeah. think about well, that's what it says about society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but you know, celebrities and, and look, we're in the midst now of, you know, celebrity changing, you know, what's going on in England. Right. Um, you know, you've got a, a, an American actress and, yep. and changing, you know, she's being blamed if you will yeah. for season 53 you know. of the crown is going to be great. <laughs> I, I can't wait. That's going to be terrific. So um, let's, uh, we, we talked about the social media. Um, I know that, family is really important to you. Um, and your mom um, is uh, 92 years old yep. uh, now mm-hmm. um, and, and doing great. Um, you have a, an interesting story about your mom and a particular advertising uh, campaign that she was part of. Talk briefly about how that developed and, and use kind of the lens of, hey, this is about marketing and how the marketing for that particular brand was leveraged by her. I think if you go all the way back to the Don Draper Mad Men days, you know, and if there was a billboard somewhere that just said, you never know, that would be kind of my mom's feeling about life and about everything. And my mom's always had that attitude and has always been willing to try different things. So at age 90, when Steve Van Zant uh, asked me if my mom would introduce her show, one of his concerts... Uh, everyone in my family thought she would never do it. I went over there with the script that Steve Van Zandt sent me, and she got up there in front of all of these people and got written up in Rolling Stone. And then before I knew it, I was getting calls from a casting agent uh, that was doing a major ad campaign for a J-Date, which is a, one of the largest Jewish dating services owned by a company that has got every possible religion you can imagine dating. And they wanted a bunch of old Jewish yentas or Jewish women to come in an audition. And we brought her into New York. And it was like a Woody Allen movie, watch, watching all these women walking around practicing their lines. And, and, and I knew my mom would crush it. And they loved her. And within 15, 20 minutes of screen testing and doing everything, uh, she got the job. And, and 
It was an incredible experience for her. And there were billboards all over the New York metropolitan area, one on top of Junior's Cheesecake on Flatbush Avenue, which was enormous, as well as subway stops. And everyone that, you know, I knew in this area would, would see her. And it, it really, you know, at the I think looking through the lens of the you never know is that you have to be able to be open to take risks at any age. And just because you're 90 years old, that doesn't mean it's over. And it bothers me so much the older I get <laughs> when I see people our age, which I think really young, kind of get overlooked. Oh, well, they're that age or they're that age. It doesn't matter. It's a state of mind. And if you have the right positive attitude, anything can happen. And after the J-Day thing, Steve Van Zandt asked my mom to actually dance on stage. And what my mom didn't know is that she'd be dancing on stage with Bruce Springsteen. And that was just an incredible night last year in Asbury Park when that happened. But these things happen only because you're, she was willing to put herself out there. Um, and she's got a bit of a pushy son, too. <laughs> well, but it, it shows, you know, getting outside your comfort zone. I, yeah. I think that's something She that, had never acted. Right? She had never been on the stage. Her sister had been a dancer and, and been involved in that world. But, you know, you never know. I mean, when I when my dad passed away, I, I thought my mom would fall off a cliff. But she turned. She decided to, you know, wait, I want to, I don't have to worry about him at this point and And let me see what else is involved and, and get more involved with my kids and my family because I live the closest of my siblings. And one thing just led to another, but uh, it, it really comes down to the you never know as being a big part of it. Yeah. And I think you never know plays into, again, for, for some of our listeners, as you're thinking through your career, you know, you may be in your first job, you may be in your second job. You don't need to be thinking about that you're stuck for the next 30 years anymore, you know, in a job. It's very or rare. In a career, right? Uh, the younger people getting out of college now, I don't know what the statistics show, but I'm sure you've seen this, you know, they spend a couple of years in their first job, I think it's uh, in their 20s now, it's something like five or six different jobs on average. And, you know, I'm not saying that's right for everyone. If you're a doctor, well, you're, you know, you're doing that or a lawyer or whatever. But um, for those that are in business or in marketing, it's not unusual to kind of learn a little bit something at one firm, realize that's not exactly where you're at, be given an op another opportunity. We're in an age where there's so many startups and so many fascinating new technologies out there giving kids uh, the opportunity to try these things, which they should. Yeah, totally agree. So we're uh, getting down to uh, the last few minutes of our show. And in keeping with the theme of playbook and football and, and some of the other things that we'll throw in that are, um, you know, the under over reference earlier before, we're going to do something called the two minute drill. So I'll ask you a few questions and uh, kind of give me what the, the first things that come into your mind. Uh, if you want to elaborate, you know, sure. Uh, so first one is the brand that you admire or that inspires you. Well, that's easy. Apple. And it's been that way for 25 years. They changed everything. They continue to do it. They do it with class. They do it with dignity. And, and, and now they're really even doing it with sustainability. So I just continue to be impressed by that organization. And it's also the only store in the mall that's ever crowded. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, favorite app on your phone? Uh, well, besides the podcasting apps, of course, Spotify, Apple, um, I, I would add Calm, which is a fantastic mindfulness and meditation app. It's really, it's so beautifully done, the videos on it. It's just really well put together. Now, I don't use it nearly enough, um, but it is comforting that it's there. So if I need to just sort of meditate, or at least pretend to meditate for a couple of minutes and work on my breathing. That Calm app uh, is, is something very, very special people should check out. Good. Last website other than Amazon that you shopped from? Uh, actually, I'm wearing it right now. It's a, it's a shirt from Untuck It, um, and they're now making uh, really nice sweaters and pullovers. So I really, I really like the way they've structured their website. They know their customer. They you know, once they realized I was there, uh, you know, they hooked me and they've done a really good job with getting new products to me via email or Facebook or Twitter. Um, so, yep, I'm wearing it right there. Something that you're not good at, but you, you wish you were. Oh, boy. Well, number one would be patience. I've never been known to have a lot of patience. And, it, you know, I, I still hear my teachers in fifth grade saying he's so careless and 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 
maybe I should have been medicated. I don't know exactly what it's about, but I, I'm trying the older I get to, to be patient with people uh, and, and really think things, think things through. I wish I was better at avoiding carbs. Um, Mark, uh, you've done a much better job of, uh, of keeping your weight in a good range in the last couple of decades. And then even though I play piano, it kills me that I can't play the guitar. I've tried two or three times and I can play a couple of chords. And I, 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 that is something that just, you know, kind of digs at me, but I have no one to blame but myself. I just need to work harder at it. And did I hear that you have an aspiration to jump out of a plane? Yeah, that is true. Uh, my kids don't believe it. My wife doesn't believe it. But I just feel like that is the ultimate experience that I'm not going to go to the moon. I'm not going to, you know, Elon Musk is not calling to, to send me up in SpaceX and I don't have the billion dollars to, to sit next to him. But just the thought of jumping out of an airplane, uh, I, I think for me, represents every possible fear in the world. I'm not a great flyer. Um, I do get nauseous easily. I get seasick, but I just want to try it. You know, I want certainly want to wait till I have grandchildren. Now, <laughs> I think I'm waiting a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, be doing it alone because neither my kids or my wife have any interest in that. The charitable organization that you are passionate about, I would say first and foremost would be Moms Demand Action. Um, I'm just so disturbed from everything that's happened from Sandy Hook to the synagogue in Pittsburgh, and that continues to happen. I just cannot believe that we live in a country that has you know, these kinds of weapons that exist and, and these mass killings. Uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying take away people's guns and go after the Constitution, but we can have common sense gun laws. And this particular organization I've been really involved in, and I, I just really, really impressed with what they're doing and they're trying. And um, we have to be better at that. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous when you don't, you don't see these things happening in Europe and other parts of the world like they happen here. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Wow, that's a really great question. Um, and I love superheroes. So uh, for me, that's tough because I always really wanted to be Batman. Um, but at the end of the day, it would be time travel. I can't think of anything cooler than to either go back in time or go into the future. Like I'd love to meet my great, great grandparents in, in Russia. I would like to learn more about um, where my grandfather came from. Um, I'd love to see my dad again. I'd love to meet some of my, see my grandparents again. I'd love the opportunity to, to, to just like talk to Abraham Lincoln and, and go back to April 14th, 1865 and say, don't go to the theater tonight. There's got to be something better to do. <laughs> And lastly, other than family, what's your most prized possession? Oh boy, that's that's very tough. Um, and I won't. I'll include dogs with my family because I, I do love I do love my dogs. But probably my 1979 Winterland Springsteen bootleg on red vinyl. This is something I got at Bleaker Bob's in, in the village in 1978 when I first started really listening to Bruce and, and had the opportunity to hear some of these live shows. And that was kind of like my lifeline in college. I spent so many hours listening to that. And it's just to this day, even though they just released a high quality version of that through Springsteen's website, it's just so important to me. And I have my photos with Bruce and, and, and things like that, but, uh, and Bruce with my mom, but that, that means a great deal to me. And then the last thing would be my piano because that's somewhere where I can sit down and feel like, hey, I can do this. I'm pretty good at it. So it's a really good feeling and it helps with stress. Well, thanks for the uh, completion of the two-minute drill. Uh, Mitch, this has been really great. I appreciate My pleasure. Uh, you participating with me. Where can our listeners find you out on social media? Sure. Well, podcast, uh, first of all, is called Financially Speaking with Mitch Slater. It's on Spotify. It will be on Apple any day soon, I'm told. Um, but you can just Google Mitch Slater and, and the podcast will come up. Uh, you certainly could find me on Facebook, um, Twitter, I'm at MP Slater, Instagram, MPS1960. If you don't like Springsteen, you probably won't want to follow either of those. Uh, but uh, LinkedIn probably would be the most important thing because I, I really try to put excellent content there. I've been very fortunate to have known a lot of LinkedIn employees from day one. In fact, I had one on my podcast, Brian Teej, who's really 
now that I think about it, I should have mentioned that show because he gave more tips on on how to use LinkedIn than than I I think anyone's written. In and any I actually book. connected with him after listening to your show, and he was he didn't know me <laughs> other than the fact that I told him that we were friends, and he was very uh, cordial, and we had a nice conversation. Yeah, so look me up on LinkedIn. I I, I think that's. That's where I'm sharing, in my opinion, the best content. All right, Mitch. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Mark. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Mitch Slater for coming on the marketing playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, networking and building your own brand is critical to your success, whether you are early in your career or a more seasoned executive. Number two, collaboration among your peers, whether in your job, your personal life, or with an organization where you donate time is really important. Be a good listener. And number three, you never know. The story that Mitch told us about his mom and Jay date demonstrated that sometimes to be successful and progress, you need to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Details Interact and learn more at DetailsInteractive.com. Until next time, the devil is in the details.